Hi, and welcome to We All Have Problems. Today's problem is failure. I want you to take 10 seconds and just think about your greatest failure. I'll give you 10 seconds to do that. What was it? Was it a failed marriage? Was it a financial decision that you thought was going to bring a lot of dividends and it didn't? Um, was, did it have to do with relationships? Did it have to do with a job? Did it have to do with schooling? Um, I remember my first semester in college. I was an A student in high school. Uh, but when I went to college, I went a little crazy. Uh, and I didn't go to something called class. Uh, and if you're going to pass classes, it's probably important to go to class. And I did not go to class uh, pretty much at all during the first semester. And when I got home, I showed my dad. I remember coming home for Christmas and showing my dad uh, my report card. My report card was point zero seven seven. I failed choir. In, in order... For you to fail choir, you, in, in order for you to make it into choir, you, you didn't have to sing well. All you had to do was show up. And I couldn't even do that. I remember feeling like a failure because I used to be a, a, a student and now I was, I was hurting my parents, I was hurting myself, I was hurting my future. What, what's your greatest failure? Today... We're going to talk about three things. Number one, we're going to talk about why is it that people fail. Number two, we're going to address some opportunities that come out of failure. And number three, we're going to have some solutions, some reactions to failure. So let's jump right into it. I'm going to go through a lot of Bible passages. You're free uh, to follow them in your computer, in your cell phone, in a physical Bible. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation uh, usually because it's English that I can understand. It's very easy to understand. So you can, wherever you're watching this, you can follow along. First thing we want to address is why do people fail? Um, scripture, the Bible, was inspired by God to help us. It's not just for our theological training. It's for our daily living. And the Bible spells out three reasons why people fail. The first reason is disconnecting. I want you to, uh, to notice this passage is found in Psalms. Psalms was written by a guy named David, well acquainted with failure. Uh, he tried to do the right thing most of the time, but he made some big boo-boos in his life. He messed up royally. He was a king, no pun intended. Now, he writes in Psalms chapter 32, when I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. So he's, he's talking about this unconfessed, unrepented sin, this mistake, this failure that was not addressed, that caused them physical anxiety. When we disconnect from God, see, God is the source of blessing. And so we, when, this, when, when we disconnect from God, uh, we, we are risking separating ourselves from the source of blessing. While not all failure has to do with us separating from God, all separation from God eventually results in failure. It's like a cell phone. When you have a cell phone and you disconnect it from the wall, from the power source, eventually it's going to go out. And usually it's going to go out at the worst possible moment when you need that to make that important phone call and you only have a 1% battery and you're trying to get through your phone call. So the first reason why the Bible tells us that we fail is that we disconnect from God. Number two is pride. Pride. Proverbs is another book in the Bible right next to Psalms. It was written by a very smart man who wasn't very wise. Right? And he writes all this short. It's like if, if the Bible had a Twitter account, it would be Proverbs. And he writes in Proverbs chapter 16... It's a big numbers. If you have a physical Bible, the big number, chapter 16, verse 18. The verses are the small numbers. It says, pride leads to destruction and arrogance to downfall. Here are the three most dangerous words in the English language. 
I already know. I don't need counseling. My spouse needs counseling. They're the one who's great. Them and their mom, my mother-in-law, she especially, she needs counseling. When we think we know it all, when we think nobody can tell us anything, when we think nobody can address any of our shortcomings. See, I want enough friends in my life that love me enough to tell me the truth about my life. When I am prideful, and by the way, uh, pride is, is a masking agent for deep insecurities. The more insecure and low self-esteem that you have, the more prideful you're going to appear because you try to overcompensate by trying to portray something you're not. Why do people fail? Number one, we disconnect. Number two, we're prideful. Number three, we take shortcuts. Notice, once again, it's in Proverbs, this Twitter account of the Bible, the writer tells us there are two keys to success. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 5. It says, good planning and hard work lead to success. But hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. Once again, what's the key to success? According to this very smart king who wasn't very wise. Hard work and good planning. If you have good planning, but you never do anything, you're not going to go anywhere. If you, if you work hard, but you, you haven't planned it out, you haven't sketched it out, you don't have a mission, you have, you have a vision, you have a clear idea, a goal of where you want to go in your life, you're going you're gonna to fail. So when we take shortcuts, so when we bypass the hard work part, when we buy, bypass the planning part, and we want to get from zero to hero in a day, you want to get rich overnight, right? You want to be happy in a marriage just the first day of their relationship. It's not going to happen. Shortcuts. Somebody said there is nowhere worth going that you can use a shortcut to get there. So three reasons why we fail. Number one, we disconnect from God, the source of blessings. Number two, we're prideful. I already know. And number three, we take shortcuts. Now, second item that we want to address in this We All Have Problems series is when we fail, what opportunities do we have? And I would suggest to you that we, are, have, we have three opportunities. When we fail, if we fail, or when we fail, I'm not, I'm not going to say if we fail, but when we fail, when we fail, if we learn from the failure, it starts being a failure and it becomes a lesson, right? So here's three opportunities that when you fail, whatever failure you're going through right now in your life, whatever failure you haven't recovered from, these are three things to keep in mind. Number one, it reveals our problems. Job is a book in the Bible about a guy that went through a hard time. If, if, if there was a, the, the poster child of failure was Job, he lost um, people of his immediate family, he lost property, he lost financial, th- I mean, he, this guy had all kinds, he even lost his health for a while. And he says, tell me what have I done wrong? Show me the rebellion and my sin. This is what Job is saying. Here's the key to what Job is saying. Job is, is, is telling us, listen, when, when, you, when you're going through a hard time, you want people to tell you some, some of the things they see. Are they always right? No, but I'd rather hear a hard truth than somebody keep it. If I go to a doctor, I don't want him to tell me everything is fine if I have cancer. I don't want to say, I don't want him to pat me in, in the back and say, I had a boy and, and send me on my way if I have lung disease. I want him to tell me the truth. So the first thing that failure does, if it's, it shines a spotlight in an area in your life that God is trying to bring attention to, what is that for you today? Is it a relationship area? Is it a financial area? Is it a job-related area? Is it a parenting area? What is it about the failure that points to an area on our, of our lives that we can say, okay, I, I need to pay attention to this. Number one, it reveals our problems. Number two, it brings people into our lives. It's, it's very interesting. I have found in my own life, you can probably testify to this as well. Whenever you're going through a, a season in your life where everything you touch, instead of turning to gold, turns to dust, God will bring people in your life to help you along the way. He will send people into your life. 
th this happened uh, to me uh, when I was when I was in college. I was looking to date somebody, and I I wasn't having a lot of success where I was going to church. So I went to another church, and I was my dad was preaching in that church. I remember as it was today, he was preaching, and he preached. And in the middle of the sermon, he stopped and pointed to a lady, a young lady that was there, asked her if she was dating anybody. She said no. And she said, that's my son back there, and asked me to stand. I was so embarrassed, but as I was talking to her afterwards, uh, I found her very attractive. And I said, I need to apologize for what my dad did, and we're gonna, I want to apologize to you uh, over dinner, several dinners. It's probably going to take several dinners for us to uh, work through all these things that have happened, this traumatic experience that, that my dad has put us through. And, and we started dating, and I thought that was going to be the one for me. I thought I was going to get married to her. But I didn't. One day she broke up with me. Broke my heart. Almost broke my spirit. I really felt like a failure. It's, it's in that season of feeling like a failure that I meet Kathy. And we became friends and then we started dating. And then 28 years ago we got married. The best thing that ever happened to me, other than that my relationship with God, is meeting my wife. And God sent her to me. In that specific moment. This is why I want you to remember this. God will sometimes allow us to experience temporary pain to bring permanent blessings. So whenever we're going to failure, number one, we know that it reveals our problems. Number two, it brings people into our lives that God has sent into our lives to bless us. And number three, it helps us to understand God's promises. I want you to notice, once again, from the book of Psalms, we'll be reading a lot of passages from, from David, well acquainted with failure. He says, Psalms 119, 140, he says, Your promises have been thoroughly tested. That's why I love them so much. What are God's promises? In Scripture, there are things that God has said about you. God's promises are simply Heaven's response to human failings. Whatever failure you're going through right now, whatever difficulty you're going through right now, there is a promise that speaks to your pain. There is a promise that speaks to your situation. There is a problem, the promise that is speaking to whatever difficulty you're going through right now. But you cannot claim a promise unless you know a promise. That's why we're going to get acquainted with how God, through Scripture, can help us as we navigate the series called We All Have Problems. And finally, how do we react to failure? We talked about what are the consequences of failure. We, got, we, we talked about what are the things that, the opportunities that it, that it provides us. And now uh, I want to end uh, our time together by talking about three common reactions that people have to failure. Whenever we fail, we do one of these three things. Two of them are not good. No bueno, I would say in Spanish. Number one is to quit. See, failure produces pain. And when you are under pain, your natural instinct is to avoid, to leave, to go away, to detach yourself from that painful situation. Revelation, this is the last book in the Bible. He is, uh, when, when John the Revelator, who wrote the book, when, when he writes, he's encouraging people who are going through tribulation, who are going through painful episodes, who are going through failure. He's saying to them, you have patiently suffered for me without quitting. It's the easiest thing to do when, you're going, when you, you've experienced failure, the easiest thing to do is to quit. But all quitting does is to make your failure permanent. But why, why is it that we want to quit? I will submit to you, there's five lies that we believe about ourselves. Number one, we believe we're the only ones struggling. We're not. Number two, we believe that we should be more successful by now, as, in compared, as compared to who? The problem that, the problem that we, why we believe we should be successful by now, we're more successful by now, is because you compare yourself to other people. And comparison is a stealer of joy. You, you, when, when, when you compare yourself to other people, you get depressed because you're comparing your 
full-length feature to somebody else's highlight reel, what they post on social media and say, my, my relationships are not like that. My kids are not like that. My boyfriend is not like that. My job is not like that. My car is not like that. But you don't know what's behind the picture. These are lies that we tell ourselves. Number three, my life is not turning out like it was supposed to. Like whose life was turning out like it was supposed to? Like who? who? My life didn't turn out the way it was supposed to. And I just want to just take a, take a moment to, to let you in on a little secret. One of the greatest blessings that we experience in, is when life does not go as it was supposed to, as you had diagrammed it. I, I want to thank God for the no's in my life. I want to thank God for the times that I wanted something, He didn't give it to me. I want to thank God for the, for the times that I planned something, and He planned something else, because God's plans are infinitely better than mine. Number four, I don't have what it takes. Why? You have an internal judge in your mind. This internal judge, right, he's called the accusing judge. He's always telling you, man, you're a fraud. Man, you're a fake. Dude, if they only knew, you're not qualified to do that job. You're not qualified to hold that position. You're not qualified. Who, who do you think you are marrying that person? Who do you think you are thinking you can be a parent? Who do you think you are aspiring for greatness? The, the, those, are, those are lies that the enemy tells us. And then number five, as a result of the first four, then you conclude, I am a failure. Once again, I want to share with you what Craig Rochelle, is one of the quotes that I read from him that, that apply to this particular point, and is this. Failure, you have to understand that failure is an event, not an identity. You can fail, but you are not a failure. So how do you react? Quitting. Quitting only makes your failure permanent. Number two. Second thing we do is we blame. Genesis chapter 16 just tells a story about Abraham and Sarah and how Abraham and Sarah could not have kids. And one day Sarah wakes up and says, Abraham, I have an idea. I want you to go sleep with my servant and have a kid with her. And Abraham, who can't hear very well, is like, what, 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 what did you t tell me? You told me that for me to sleep with your servant? And she said, yeah, sleep with my servant, have a child with her because God had promised them a child, but she was... She could not conceive. She, she was barren. She could not have kids. So she came up with an alternative plan. We don't need to help God. My job is not to obey God. My job is not to help God. My job is to obey God. So he tells Abraham and he sleeps with his, their servant. And she becomes pregnant. And then she has a baby. And then now they're fighting. The two women are fighting. And in, in the middle of all this drama... Sarah says to Abraham the following words. Genesis chapter 16, verse 5. Sarah said to Abraham, this is all your fault. What? Like, you, you're the one with the idea, bro. You're the one that came up with the idea of saying to your husband to go sleep with somebody else. See, it's much easier to blame somebody. It's much easier to blame our parents. It's much easier to blame the government. It's much easier to blame our husband. It's more, much easier to blame our kids. It's much easier to blame everybody else but ourselves. At some point, we have to look in the mirror and say, maybe the reason I have terrible luck with relationships is not the people that I pick. It's the people who's picking the people that I pick. Maybe the reason I'm not really making good sound financial decisions is because I buy things that I don't need with money I don't have to impress people I don't even like. Maybe the reason, it's me. So blaming does not work. The only thing that blame does is that it camouflages your past into your future. Quitting doesn't work. Blaming doesn't work. So what works? What's the solution? What's the reaction? What is the reaction to failure? All right, you messed up. You tried and it didn't work out. Whatever area that is, it relationships and parenting and job related, schooling, whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish, you have some health goals. I want to lose 20 pounds this year, but I only lost five. Or I want to lose 20 pounds, but I gained three, you know. But whatever problem, difficulty or failure you're having, what's the key? Here's the key. The key is this. You can grow from this. 
You can grow from this. Philippians was written by a guy named Paul, also well acquainted with failure. God had to knock him off his high horse, literally, so he can learn a couple of lessons. And he tells us two keys to grow from failure, two keys. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 says, I have not yet achieved my, my goal, and I am not perfect, but Christ has taken a hold of me, so I keep on running. Clue number one, keep on running. You fell down, understand you're not perfect, right? Search for, not for perfection, but for progress. You've messed up. I keep on running. I, I get up and I try again. I don't say all oh, men are dogs just because I had issues with one. I don't say, well, nobody loves me just because I had one failed relationship. I don't say, well, I'm never going to make money because I, I lost my money in one failed business juncture. I'm not going to say I'm not cut out for school because I failed one semester. I keep on running. Verse 13, my friends, I don't feel that I have already arrived, but I forget what is behind. Here's the second key. First key, I keep on running. Second key is I forget what is behind. Very hard to do. Cornerbacks in the NFL. I don't know if you find out the NFL, but I like the NFL. I like the Dallas Cowboys. My favorite team. They tell cornerbacks, you have to have a short memory. You can't remember the last play. If you got burned for a touchdown, you have to move on. Right? This, this, this concept of like, I can't, I can't camouflage my past into my future. I have to move on. I have to go ahead. I have to keep on running. I have to forget what happened. I have to learn from it, but I have to forget what happened and look at this day as a different day with the, learned, with the lessons that I've learned in my past. There's a lot of people throughout history that recover from failure. I like to study some of them. The, the reason that we have, we have chips today is because somebody that was in a tortilla factory burned some tortillas and chips were discovered. Stuff that you enjoy today came out of a failure. The reason you eat popsicles in the summer is because somebody left a juice container with a stick in it that he used to move it around outside in the wintertime. And we went out the next day, he's like, hey, this, and that's how popsicles were invented. Most of the great things that you see today came out of a failure. One of the greatest, quote unquote, failures, especially I felt like that at that moment, was when Christ died. When he died, it seemed like a failure. The, the savior of the world, the one who was going to liberate it from the Romans, all these great things were going to happen, now he's in the ground and buried. And he's in the ground and buried. He's there for three days. And the devil is rejoicing. And the disciples are crying. And it seems like all hope is lost. But on the third day, hey, on the third day, Jesus raises up. See, I, I went to Israel and they showed me all these tombs. And they said, here's, here's David. And they showed me the tomb of David. And here's... The tomb of Isaiah and Jeremiah, and this was this guy is buried here, and this lady is buried here, and this prophet is buried there, and this apostle is buried here. And we went to Rachel's, Rachel's tomb, and they put strings around it because it provides fertility, and all these tombs. And then we went to one tomb, and that tomb was empty. There was a little sign on the door that says, He is not here, for He is risen. So your hope is not built on your capacity to achieve but in God's capacity to redeem. And the reason we can rejoice today and we can have hope, even in the midst of problems, is because Christ not only died, but He resurrected. And His resurrection guarantees that the worst situation that I'm going through, my worst day, Christ's resurrection, guarantees that my worst day is not my last day. So I want to pray for you now, and if you're watching this online, or if you're watching this in your cell phone, and there's going to be an opportunity afterwards to connect with us. But I just want to let you know that if there's a failure that you're going through right now, God understands, God knows, God cares, and God can help. So I want to pray for whatever failure you're going through right now. I want to give you a couple of seconds so you can think about it and we can pray 
together and remember, God sometimes allows temporary pain to bring permanent blessings. Let me pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, we pray for everybody who's watching this, who's going through a painful, difficulty experience in their life. I want to pray that you will give them encouragement, that you will give them in, uh, enlightenment, that you will give them discernment so they know what the next step is, that you will give them the ability to put the past and the bitterness and the, whatever happened, the pain that happened in the past. And I want to pray, Heavenly Father, that through your Holy Spirit, wherever somebody is watching right now, whether with a group of people by themselves, the Holy Spirit will bring peace into the heart. And you will allow us to trust in a God that reminds us that because of His resurrection, our worst day is never our last day. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen.